Good evening and welcome to our 27th district debate here at the Independent. Please give a round of applause for coming out tonight. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. We want to do a little bit of a sound check with uh, both of our candidates. So please, uh, Ms. Jalen, would you speak a few brief words into the mic? How about today is Wednesday? Today actually is Wednesday, uh, contrary to the report in the Somerville News. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Sponsoring the debate now. And how about you, Ken? Look at all these people who got it right. That's they must true. have cared That's so true. much. Another. Another one. Ken. Tomorrow is the day after the Red Sox win this evening. That didn't get a cheer? I don't understand that. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> oh my goodness. You're about to get booted, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is Baratunde Thurston. I'll be moderating the debate this evening. And we have here uh, incumbent representative Pat Jalen and her challenger from the Republican Party, Mr. Dane Baird. The debate will last approximately one hour. I want to lay some of the ground rules out. Uh, and thank you all for coming out to the pre-Red Sox game show. I know it's hard for you to tear your... Were there people booing? Do we like the Red Sox here? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's okay. That could make the night more interesting than I expected it to be. Okay. Uh, the way the debate's going to work, we had a coin cost in the beginning to determine who's going to take the opening statement first. We have a set of prepared questions for each of the candidates. They will have three minutes to respond and one minute to rebut. Uh, their contestants, re, uh, their opponents' response. We will then open the floor to questions from you guys, the members of the Somerville community, for roughly 10 minutes, and then we will have closing statements from each one, also determined by the same coin toss. Are you ready for the debate? Yeah. All right. Uh, we will have our opening statement, once again, toying, uh, coin toss, from Pat Jalen. You have four minutes. Thank you, Baratundi. Okay. And I want to thank the Somerville News for giving us this opportunity and the Independent Restaurant and Ken Kelly for inviting us here. I think this is a great I idea. Um, somebody asked me tonight how many, how recently I debated anybody, and the truth is I haven't had an opponent who wanted to debate in a long time, so I think this is a good thing. I always look for ways to encourage people to talk to me and write to me and be in contact with me, and so this is just another of those ways. I want to tell you first the things I hear from Somerville people about what they're concerned about, and then in the question period, I think we'll be able to get to some of those, some of what I've been doing about them. The people in Somerville are very diverse, but I think we share some real concerns, and the ones that I would identify tonight are income security education, health care, and housing. Those are all extremely closely related. Um, and I think that income security ties them all together. By income security, I mean the fact that working people are finding it very hard to support their families on one income, or even two incomes, or even three incomes. Um, they're working harder. Pay hasn't gone up as much as inflation has, and it certainly hasn't gone as up as much as health care and housing have. Too many peop other people who are looking, ha can't find work, or are working temp jobs, or part-time jobs, or groups of part-time jobs, when they really need full-time work with benefits. And too many kids, I talked to eighth graders today who said they wanted to change um, the child labor laws so 13 year olds could work and help support their families. I think it's really unfortunate that too many kids are working too long of hours and that doesn't do the good for their education. But income security and education are also closely related. Um, our children obviously are, deserve an equal start in life regardless of the property tax base of their communities. And during the budget crisis, Massachusetts has cut education spending uh, more than any other state and I'll talk about that later. But education, uh, improved education also helps economic growth. Speaker Finneran appointed me to a group, a task force this year on jobs in the economy, and we heard testimony from business leaders across the state that two of the biggest barriers to business expansion are lack of an educated workforce and housing costs. Um, income security and health care are also so related. More and more people don't get health care at their work and they can't afford it on their own. I've talked to 
several small business people in Somerville as well as people working temp and part-time jobs who simply don't have insurance and have to count on the free care pool. This actually isn't trivial. The lack of health care is the third leading cause of death in people 50 to 64 years old. And that's, if we could get rid of cancer or, or um, heart disease, we would do it in a flash. We could do that for health insurance. The cost of prescription drugs is a particular concern for seniors, but it's a concern actually of all of us because we all pay. We all pay in higher insurance premiums. We all pay in higher taxes because the state has to pay high prices. And housing costs, that's the last of the four points. Housing costs have doubled in Somerville in the last 10 years. I don't think our incomes have doubled. Too many people who grew up here can't afford to stay or they're living in their parents' third floor, like my family. Um, or people are working two or three jobs to pay the rent. People in neighborhoods around the city are upset at developers who are trying to squeeze more and more houses into smaller and smaller spaces, and none of them are affordable. One last thing about Somerville people's interest. I don't think they are just self-interested. I've had a bunch of coffees in senior buildings in the last few weeks. In three buildings, I asked them what we should do with the bill billion, I'm oh, sorry, I'm used to the state budget. Uh, some of them got a, about a million dollars in additional local aid this summer thanks to the legislature deciding not to do Romney's tax cut, which would have given you $100 each. Uh, instead, we spent the money on sending it back to local aid, and Somerville has a million extra dollars. So I asked the seniors, what would you do with that? I thought they would be talking about a senior shuttle, some kind of thing for themselves. In every single building, the first answer and the unanimous answer was spend it on education. That's the kind of people I'm proud to represent, the people of Somerville who care not just about themselves, but about their neighbors. Thank you very much, Ms. Dillon. Uh, just a note on the time. We're going to try to keep the time very tight. I, you went over about... I didn't... Is there any, like, more... Well, I will step forward when we're approaching the end of the time at about 30 seconds. And just to be fair to you, Mr. Baird, you'll have four minutes and 30 seconds for your response. If you want to add a few extra uh, okay. words or mention of the Red Sox. All right. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Again, the Red Sox are playing, and you're here. So, that means uh, you have a higher calling to mm -hmm. Somerville, and I think that's great. Special thanks to Ken Kelly for sponsoring this, uh, Neil McCabe for sponsoring this event. Also like to say uh, uh, special thanks to uh, all my supporters, to uh, the thousands of people that I've met thus far going door to door, uh, getting the message out on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, for someone who's not an incumbent, that's what's required uh, to win, which I plan to do on November 2nd. Um, also want to say a special thanks, you know, again to, uh, you know, family and friends who've uh, stayed by my side, even people who don't like uh, politics, they've been by my side when I've asked them to help out, and I do appreciate that. That's what's called loyalty. Uh, and of course, to my fiance, the love of my life, uh, she's uh, put up with a lot. Okay, so first thing I want to do is I need to learn from Pat because my picture looks terrible. I mean, this looks terrible. Pat's got a great smile. I'm not photogenic, so we need to work on that. Second thing is this campaign is, nothing, is, is about nothing more than results. The incumbent to my right, to your left, has not produced for the city. If you want to actually take, extract tax dollars from your constituents and then not perform, that is not good. Everyone here expects results. Everybody does. And continually, throughout her 14 years, she has dropped the ball on some serious Somerville-specific issues. Now, she's very, very good, has special interests, and she has a, plays a very strong hand. But I will show you this evening that she has not performed, and our tax dollars are being wasted, and she doesn't have a fundamental understanding of economics, of housing policy, of I mean, you name it. There are many, many issues that I take issue with her. And I think, uh, given who I am, a uh, small business owner here in Somerville, a uh, veteran in the United States military, very results-oriented, very common sense in terms of policy, and very approachable for the very diverse needs of Somerville, I believe that I can be the better representative for our fine city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. 
I want to remind everybody, both of the candidates signed a 250-page memorandum of understanding. <laughs> they have agreed not to make any eye contact, uh, nor to mention the other's mother by name. Okay. We're well, nice, clean, fine. true? It's very true. <laughs> so check with your staff representative. Uh, our first question uh, for you, Ms. Jam. Uh, how would you characterize your relationship with Mayor Joseph Curtitone, and can you cite an example of a project or issue the two of you worked on together? Reminder, you have three minutes, and I will step forward when you have 30 seconds left to make it a bit more clear. Okay. okay. I think we have a good working relationship. I'd like to mention two things that I expect to be working with him in, on in the next two months. Uh, the first is the Green Line Extension. Um, I was able to get money in the House Transportation Bond Bill this summer, the second largest allocation in the state. Unfortunately, the Senate didn't include it at the last minute, but we'll keep working on it. We're lucky to have an active community group step, which gave out a flyer tonight about the Green Line meeting next Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the high school. I hope you'll all come. It's important for Somerville to have a unified uh, voice there. I know uh, Mayor Curtitone is interested in it, and we'll work together to get it all the way next year. Um, just pointing out that I did get it in the House budget. I'm not a senator. Uh, the other issue I expect to work on with the mayor um, very closely is the Lowell Street Bridge. As you know, it's been closed for four years, and we had a meeting at, that I called two weeks ago with the highway department to have them explain the process, which they promised is going to start by next Tuesday. And I emailed them yesterday to say, wait a minute, where is it? Um, but we learned that there's not going to be pedestrian access during the construction. I'm very upset about that, and I've asked the mayor and Senator Shannon to join me in writing to uh, Commissioner C C Cagliano and make sure that there is pedestrian access. It'll cost about a quarter of a million dollars. I think it's worth it. Somerville doesn't get enough for its transportation money, and we are crossed by these eight uh, rail lines which cut up our city, pollute our air, don't stop, and they mean that all our bridges have to be, uh, our, we're dependent on our bridges which cross the, tr the rail lines. We've had four bridges repaired since I've been in office, but that means that there have been four bridges, well, five bridges, out of, out of repair while I've been in office. So um, it's unacceptable that there not be p pedestrian access, especially with the v and uh, residents there at the, at, right at the bridge and they need to go over to CBS and to Magoon Square. So um, that's two things that I think we can work on together. Thank you, Mr. Baird. You have one minute to respond. Sure. Um, I don't know how to start, maybe with a question. How do you think you can better achieve the results that we all know that we need in, in the field of transportation? Transportation, for those who aren't from Somerville, I see some people here from Somerville, from my hometown, Belmont. Somerville has, uh, at the turn of the century, Somerville had eight railheads. Now we have eight rails going through, but only one stop. Somerville used to be a bustling economy. We had, at the turn of the century, we had manufacturing. If Somerville was a place to work, a place to play, and a place to live. It is no longer that. It's only two of those things, a place to live and a place to play. And so transportation is a large part of making a, uh, a new Somerville, a Somerville that is a place to work. Now, I don't understand how a 14-year incumbent who considers uh, transportation endeavors paramount to the success of our city is not, does not have a, uh, a position on the Transportation Committee, did not, did, did not actually, did, has not been able to close the deal. It doesn't matter if you get something passed in the House. It matters if you close the deal. And you are not a deal closer. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response. Our next question. We'll go to Mr. Baird. Uh, the Republican Party has been a permanent minority in the state legislature for decades. How can the voters of Somerville expect a Republican to effectively represent the city? Uh, excellent question, and I will answer it. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, I think the expectations for voters are, uh, are low. Uh, they're used to not uh, getting performance out of the, uh, the incumbent. And so I don't think it will be all that difficult for me to make an impact one, once elected on November 2nd. Um, secondly, um, I have been on a walkabout. I have been to almost every house, not all, every residence, myself personally, to get the message out that the, A, there's a new face, and B, with a new message and a new vision. Some people have agreed, some people have disagreed. That's fine. I'm learning. I'm learning from each individual that I meet. What 
they say, and these are even Ms. Jalen's supporters, is that, yeah, you know, Pat, you know, she, yeah, she has some difficulty with House members, or she has some difficulties with some of her peers. You know, that's fine, but not when Somerville has to suffer. We need to start producing results for our city. It is unacceptable to pay your tax dollars every quarter, every week, and not have results, and we have not gotten that. So it doesn't matter if you get something passed in the House but not in the Senate, i.e. Somerville doesn't get the quarter billion dollar capital outlay for a T extension. That's ludicrous, it's not a success. Uh, I'd like to say that I, I think it's very hard to be effective as a minority, and I know several Republicans who are quitting this year because they found it so frustrating. I have also been frustrated because I've been in a minority as a progressive Democrat, um, but we found some ways to be successful, sometimes by working with Republicans. For example, last year, the Speaker wanted to give a pay raise to some of his lieutenants. Um, we fought that, and we won. Um, in another example, we worked with other Democrats. I could give you a list of the tax cuts we passed that benefit working families. There were plans to pass tax cuts that only benefited corporations, and we got tax cuts that benefited working families by an increase in the earned income tax credit, uh, the increase in the dependent allowance, the increase in the um, personal exemption, and the first um, renters increase in the renter's deduction and um, also a circuit breaker for seniors. So I think uh, it's very possible to be uh, effective as a minority. My concern is that a Republican would not represent the real interests of the city. Another rebuttal? Oh, we got more rebuttals? No, we have a sound oh. issue. <laughs> uh, may, may I just uh, insert here while we're getting the sound issue worked out, is in 1997, Pat did not vote for an increase of the family uh, income deduction. That means if you're a family, that means if you're a family, y you could have gotten a $1,600 deduction off off your uh, tax return. I she voted against that. All right. all, that's public record. That was. I'm sorry. Point, I'm sorry. So I'm not going to answer. I'm going to answer that. Um, he has misstated my pu my public record, my voting record, over and over and over. I can't come up with an answer for every single thing he says, but the, you'll see in the journal tomorrow that I think there are three issues where he misstates my record. The Republican Party gave him $4,500 worth of research into my voting record. He can look at thousands of votes, thousands of votes, and, and he you still have voted thousands gets of it times. wrong. You have voted thousands of That's times. Right. That's correct. That's right, and he gets right. it okay. wrong. Thank you both very much. We'll go back to the program. Our next question uh, for Representative Jalen. The city's anti-gang ordinance had to be approved by the state as a home rule petition before becoming law. Can you describe your opinion of the anti-gang ordinance? And can you describe your participation, uh, your opinion of the anti-gang ordinance and your participation as the bill moved through the state house? Three Thanks. Minutes. I'm for any law that increases public safety. I don't think the gang ordinance does that. There are a lot of proposals that sound good and provide the illusion of safety, but no real safety. Uh, the only costs for this one so far are that it has diverted so much of people's attention from real solutions. Second, that it's alienated a lot of members of the Latino community who are key to resolving the problem. And third, that if, it's res if it is ever used, it may provoke a lot of expensive lawsuits. The main reason I don't think it's going to help is it's very hard to use. Denise Provo outlined 13 elements that will have to be proved in court in order to use the gang ordinance. Martha Coakley, our district attorney, said that it would be very, very, very difficult to bring a prosecution under this law. Uh, I've talked with uh, police and legislators from other communities about how they do uh, suppress gangs in other communities. They say they have lots of tools that are already successful. The federal government calls its approach, the tested approach, weed and seed. The reason it's called weed is you take out the leaders. You need targeted and coordinated um, prosecutions, and this, just this summer we saw an effective use of that. 29 gang members from MS-13 were picked up from several communities around by coordinated work between the police departments, the DA's office, and the state police. 
Only one of those happened to be found in Somerville. But that one raid is probably one of the reasons we didn't have as much gang violence in Somerville this year as we did last year. Uh, and the reason can't be the gang ordinance. We still haven't had an appointment to the to the advisory committee, which has to be created before the gang ordinance is ever um, enforced. The second tool that I'd use would be uh, probation. If you're if you're on probation and anybody that's vulnerable to the gang ordinance has to have already been adjudicated. If you're up on probation, one of your conditions of probation should be you stay out of pro problem areas and you stay away from problem people. If you uh, go, um, disobey the terms of your probation, you're off the street. You don't have to wait for another court of adjudication as you would under the gang ordinance. Uh, um, I'd like to see the return of community policing. I'm extremely disappointed that we have lost our community policing officers. More people have told me that they feel less safe in the parks since we lost them, and I'd like to see that come back. And that's why I fought for more local aid this summer, and I'll fight for more next year. As for stopping recruitment, which is the seed part of it, you're cutting up, you're getting rid of the leaders, but then you sh shut off the recruitment. I'm glad to see teen empowerment in our city. Are you standing forward now? I'm standing forward. Oh my goodness. 25 seconds. Okay. Um, I'm glad to see teen empowerment coming into the city. I'm concerned about the uh, high school's dropout rate when you have kids on the street that don't have a high school diploma and aren't working. It's a real source of concern. So those are some of my thoughts about the gang ordinance. Thank you. Mr. Baird, you have one minute. Sure. So why an anti-gang ordinance? The reason is because public safety is not only a civic right, it's a natural right. All of us as Americans deserve it. And for legislators to ignore uh, the facts that we are a city under siege by this gang called MS-13 is fooling herself and not serving her constituents well. It's a legislator's civic duty to guarantee the public good. And to not do so is un-American and just plain wrong. In stark terms, what happened, the reason why the anti-gang ordinance originated first in Chicago and now uh, has uh, come over from the Midwest to, uh, to our region in New England is because of violent, heinous crimes against our citizens, and specifically two rapes in 2002 against young girls, quadriplegic. I mean, this is disgusting. And you need to tell evil when you see it and call it what it is. You need to tell it, we, have a, we, we will make you account. We have standards, and one of them is safety. It's that simple. Time's up. Um, hold on one second. I'm sorry. This is a very important Mr. issue. Baird, I'm sorry we have reached the, uh, the end of the one minute. It doesn't bring me any pleasure to do this, but I do want to make sure okay. each candidate has the appropriate time. OK. Thank you. Okay. Our next question will be directed toward you, Mr. Baird. Uh, before running for state representative, can you describe your involvement in the Somerville community? You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. It's another good question. So I have a story for us. So we were holding signs, some volunteers were holding signs for me on Saturday in Davis Square, and this van came around the corner. It had Howard Dean, you know, with stickers all over it. And the gentleman stuck his head out of his van and said, carpetbagger, bear carpetbagger, indicating that I just moved here from Belma and I'm a Mitt Romney stooge and all that stuff. Well, I've been here and I'm going on my fifth year, so love this city. Anyway, it was pretty funny. So I lived here in Somerville for over uh, four years and uh, I've done a lot in Somerville. Um, thus far, I run a small, successful bi uh, business uh, in real estate. Uh, we start off in, in renovations of uh, pre-existing, and now we're getting into things like new construction. I employ 15 people regularly, uh, so I do know what it's like to hold a payroll. I think uh, Pat's never held a real job or had uh, the responsibility of that. Uh, I'm sorry, Pat, that came out wrong. But anyway, to make a long story. I, I, um, so I've hired, I've hired a Somerville youth, I've worked with the city, uh, uh, high school students have worked for me, and that's a great experience for students because they get a chance to realize what it means to work for, work for a living, what responsibility means, what hard work means, and these are things that are often not taught in the classroom. Um, 
I've actually uh, run some al Alzheimer's benefits in the name of my uh, uh, grandfather. We laid my grandfather to rest on October 17th of last year, uh, victim of Alzheimer's 10 years. And uh, I felt he was such a beautiful man, such a big, big heart, that I thought it would be uh, in his name, it would it'd do him uh, uh, an honor if we were to uh, you know, raise some money uh, for a, a very, uh, uh, I think, um, a, a great cause. And that is, is that we cannot, uh, we cannot allow our, you know, our elderly to live, you know, one, of every six, one out of every 10 people 65 years and older has Alzheimer's, uh, five out of 10 people 85 years and older has Alzheimer's. So I felt very strongly that we need a cure and we need it now, not tomorrow. And so I activated. Uh, and lastly, I served uh, Somerville as well as our country in the United States Army. I was an infantry officer for close to three years. Um, I love this country. It is the number one place to live in the world. I have lived in different places in the world. And it's something that is uh, worth fighting for and defending. And so um, I am a public servant. And uh, at, when elected November 2nd, I will uh, be your state representative and serve you then. Thank you. You have one minute, Ms. Taylor. I'm sorry to hear that being a teacher is not a real job. And uh, My apologies. I came out wrong. I've been a volunteer in dozens of organizations in Somerville over the years. The first way I got involved in Somerville was when I first moved here, a gang of kids from the nearby street broke windows in my house. I helped form the Ward 2 Civic Association. We started a teen center. And with other people around the city and putting a few people in jail, um, we stopped that problem. 30 seconds. I think people's civic involvement tells you a lot about the, their values. I know people because I go to dozens of meetings every month. And Mr. Baird's main contribution to our community has been to develop a bunch of unaffordable condominiums. Rentals, rental property tax. Sorry. Um, next. I thought that, oh, excuse me, the people on White Street Place told me you were going to. The 250 page memorandum of Ooh. understanding speaks for itself. Our next question will go to Representative Jalen. What are your legislative priorities for the upcoming term if you are reelected? My top priorities are to restore and expand education and health care. <laughs> During the 90s, we put billions of new dollars into education in Massachusetts, and that was largely due to mm. the school finance suit, which I helped start. To say that I haven't produced for this city denies the fact that over the 90s, school aid to Somerville was increased by $12 million a year. <laughs> During the 90s, we also passed $4.5 billion in tax cuts, many to wealthy corporations. In 2001, the market crashed the recession in 9-11, combined with the phase-in of those cuts to produce an ongoing budget deficit, which the Mass pa Taxpayers Association now estimates at $750 million. When state revenue went up, local aid to Somerville went up by millions, uh, tens of millions of dollars a year. When state revenue went down, Massachusetts cut education more than any other state in the country. Just this week, I learned that teachers may be moved from West Somerville and Brown schools to schools in the eastern part of the city uh, because of underperformances. So I'll be working to restore funding for education. Uh, this Somerville, uh, we got almost a million in new aid um, to Somerville, which I mentioned before. But there's also another million dollars in changes in the charter school formula, which I've been working on for seven years. And that paid off this year with about $900,000 in new money for Somerville. In addition to which, I've been working as a top priority within the budget every year to increase the aid for special education. Um, there's an addition to the fact that we, because of a negotiated uh, plan for changing the school building assistance uh, funding, uh, Lincoln Park will be built in 2007 instead of 2015. That's an achievement of the legislature, which I'm, which I'm pretty proud of. The formula is very important. This year we'll be looking again at the Chapter 70 formula because of the court suit, which I helped start, which is back in court saying that funding is still inadequate, especially after the cuts. Uh, so I will be working on that to make sure Somerville gets its fair share of new aid. 
My second pr priority is health care, and, and I am much more optimistic this year uh, with a new speaker uh, that we can get my Fair Drug Pricing Act passed. Um, that is a bill that would allow Massachusetts to negotiate prices not only for seniors but for every person in the Commonwealth. That would save individuals, companies, and the Commonwealth millions of dollars. And my work on prescription drugs is why I was le named Legislator of the Year last year by the Mass Senior Action Council. Mr. Baird, you have one minute. Again, this uh, campaign is about performance and results. Uh, Lowell Street Bridge, failure. Uh, Dillboy Field, the hockey rink on Somerville Avenue, failure. Pat, you realize that this isn't coming just out of thin air. This is coming from your peers in the city. Aldermen, I interviewed the majority of aldermen who would meet with me. Uh, I met with the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> some of them would not, wouldn't return my calls, but some did. And I met with them, and they told me, Pat, quote unquote, Pat would not lift a finger for Dillboy Field. And it's answers like that or responses like that which tell you the truth. And it's time for a change. There are major capital improvements in this city that are not happening, and it's because of the lady to my right. Some, uh, the hockey rink was finished. Excuse me. Ah. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. 250 pages. Mr. Baird, uh, we have a very similar question for you. What are your legislative priorities for the upcoming term if you are elected? You have three minutes. Yeah, sure. Uh, Same question to Mr. Baird. Le legislative focus. Uh, first off is community uh, stabilization. Uh, homeland security is uh, uh, homeland security at the state level as well as uh, uh, supporting the anti-gang ordinance locally. Um, homeland security, 92% of the executives today do not think they'll be attacked by a terrorist. That's fine, but that's not true. One of the number one things terrorists attack are economic interests. So what we need to do is is in, not incent them. I am a laissez-faire, free market individual, but I strongly believe that we have to develop standards, not just the state level, but also at the federal level, work very closely with uh, federal authorities, and make sure that we have standards across the board. Why is that? Because companies feel that if they make the extra investment and, and take on the extra cost of these security measures, that that will be a competitive disadvantage. That needs to go away. We need standards. We need to keep our homeland safe. Again, I will support the anti-gang ordinance. It makes sense. Uh, we need a new vision for Somerville. It's not working. Again, Somerville needs to be a place not only to live and not only to play, but also a place to work. Uh, we need to get one of my first uh, initiatives will be to get appointment to the Transportation Committee, which is crucial for this city, something that Pat hasn't done and will never do. What you're going to get with Ms. Jalen is the same old results uh, and little action. We need action. Uh, we need to create special economic zones in the city. We, and they need to have tax revenue, commercial tax receipt revenue quotas. This city has 37% of its budget comes from the state. That means every time the state has a shortfall in tax revenues, we get hurt. It's plain and simple. We need to become, we need to take, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and become fiscally independent. We shouldn't be that dependent. That's a huge risk factor for us and something, again, that Ms. Jalen hasn't succeeded on. She's the founder of the Mystic View Task Force. She has not been able to get the Mystic View Task Force. She has not been able to get the city and the developers in one room and produce a result. This has been going on for six years. And for six years, we have not recognized one dollar in tax revenue. And you can say whatever you want about the Mystic View Task Force and how they're always right. And that's fine. They have some very bright people. But it's the results. Okay. It's getting a foot in the ground or a shovel in the ground. That has not happened. Hold on one second. Housing. Pat's, Pat is so off on housing, it's ridiculous. She does not want to build new housing. We, we create half the housing that we need here in Somerville. Why do you think housing costs are so high? This is simple economics, which she does not understand. You need to make supply to equal demand to drive down housing prices. She would rather, she would ra she, she, she would rather have low-income housing and penalize you with taxes. Everybody, please maintain the level of calmness. Thank you. 
Ms. Jalen, you will have one minute and five seconds to respond. I thought that it was rebutting. Oh, I'm confused about that. That was his response to the question. You have a minute oh. of your own to respond. Okay. To his response. I got confused. On five seconds because he went over slightly. Okay. It's so hard to know where to start. Um, let me just say that I think that there are at least two sides to the issue in Assembly Square. My role in Assembly Square is that as soon as the city can get uh, a plan for developing enough um, jobs and riders at Assembly Square, it's my job to try to bring the Orange Line stop there. That's my job. And I think that the reason we haven't had so much activity in Assembly Square as we wish, good development in Assembly Square has been held up partly by the fact that the city sold Yard 21, which was the that was supposed to be the catalyst for development at Assembly exactly. Square. Uh, they sold it to the low bidder and gave them seven years to even pay the four million dollars that they offered to, that they bid for the property. That's supposed to be the catalyst for development at Assembly Square. It hasn't happened. They have seven years to pay the four million dollars. We'd have eight million dollars in our pocket and we'd have development underway if they had given it to the other developer. Thank you both for submitting to the questions. We're now going to involve uh, some of the people from the audience. We'd like, if you can, to speak loudly when you ask your question, question. We will give each candidate 90 seconds to respond to your question and their opponent 30 seconds if, they'd like, if they have a comment on their opponent's uh, response. I hope that's clear. We have about- No, I, I say that again. You'll have 90, Bob asks a question. Yeah. <laughs> then you guys will have 90, you'll have 90 seconds to answer it. And Mr. Uh, Baird will have uh, 30 seconds to respond to your response. Everybody clear on that? Okay. Please uh, step forward as you can over here. Are we cool with Somerville Access Television? Okay. Sir in the pink shirt, I saw your hand first. He's coming forward, thank you. Mr. Baird. Um, can you name two vetoes of Governor um, Romney's that you would have voted to override, and can you name two that you would have voted to sustain? Uh, off the bat, no. I can tell you a lot about uh, your uh, candidate's uh, uh, voting record, which is... Um, I know. I, I, I cannot. I, I, can't, I can't tell you that every time that the governor has offered uh, legislation to reform a corrupt, wasteful state house, she has not voted the governor's way. Uh, repealing part of the Pacheco law, $273 million of estimated savings for you, the taxpayer, going to waste. The merger of the two transportation authorities, that's $190 million estimated savings right there. Again. This is especially curious given that Somerville is so dependent on state local aid that she did not lead on the road to reform. You have to do what is right for your constituents. You need to provide for them. If you're that dependent on state local aid, you better get a plan to save the local aid before it gets cut, which is dead. This seconds. is under your leadership. You have 30 seconds to respond, Ms. Shannon. I'm just going to read a quote from a senator who's a Republican from Weymouth and is the ranking member of the Transportation Committee. We need more open-minded legislators of any ideological stripe and less sheep. Representative Jalen has demonstrated leadership and foresight on behalf of her constituents on transportation issues. As a senior Republican member of the Transportation Committee, I appreciate her efforts in building a coalition to oppose wasteful, special interest transportation spending in order to maintain funding right. for important Massachusetts Show me the money. Transit. No money. I'm going to ask, uh, we seem to have formed a line over here. I appreciate the self-organizing fashion of the <laughs> folks of Somerville. Please say your name and which street you live on as you ask your question. If you don't mind sharing. Sure. Dane, my name's John Shea. I live on Highland Avenue. Hey, you used a word a little while ago I was really concerned about. You said un-American. Yeah. And what to me that divides people, it's like George Bush right now saying you're either with me or against me. Yeah. And I was talking about the ordinance for the gangs. And if you don't support that, then you're un-American. It reminds me of a system when I first read about it, once called apartheid, where if you're not white and there's more than three of you on a street corner, there's potential to be arrested. With so many immigrants and people of color in this city, I'm concerned, I'm concerned about your support 
for people of color or immigrants in this country? Sure, I mean, there is no color in my world. You know, everything, you know, if you come up to me and say, hey, I am ABC, I live on High Highland Avenue, I say, great. It's based on merit, it's based on things like loyalty and values, but it has nothing to do with color. Nothing to do with it. Any uh, response, Mr. Allen? It wasn't just really, give you an opportunity. It wasn't really and to me. I just want to remind the people, don't make me take my jacket off. Okay, you guys have got to call me. Hey, Barrett Tundee, do I, have, I still have a little time? Oh, Maybe. you do? I thought you were oh, going okay. Oh, well then. Well, yeah, I just said, you know, sometimes a little bit slow, Pat. Give me a break, okay? Please so, uh, secondly, this has nothing to do about race. This is called safety. I mean, put yourself in the victim's shoes. Why is it never about the victim and always about the gang members? That is ridiculous. You need to put both parties, I would put the gang members second, personally, but you need to think about both parties. And this candidate will not go to bat for public safety, and that is flat wrong. I'm a woman. I've lived here for 37 years. I've raised a daughter and two sons. I'm raising a granddaughter in my house. To think that I don't care about public safety or the safety of children or the safety of women is so insulting and ludicrous, I have a hard time responding. Well then, act. Thank you. Hi. Excuse me, Mr. Bear. My name is Mark Stoloff. I live on Greenville hey. Street. How are you? Hey, Mark. Um, I'm a homeowner. I'm curious when you talk about independence from state aid. Somerville had the opportunity to bootstrap a little bit this year with cuts from state aid. My property taxes went up by a third. True. Um, if there are further increases, if you, for example, pardon me for a second, if we were to cut off state aid completely, property taxes could possibly double in the name of keeping income taxes lower. I'm sorry. So basically what you're talking about is shifting the tax burden from the people who are best able to pay to property owners all over Somerville, some of whom, like me, are able to pay, some sure. of whom bought into the city in the 70s and 80s when people like you and me didn't want to live here sure. and bought their houses not knowing what it would turn into today. Right. So I want to know how can you represent Somerville effectively and propose a policy that would shift the tax burden from the people who are best able to pay to our neighbors, some of whom are on fixed incomes. Right. It's not a, pe it's not a resident to, uh, to resident or a state to resident shift. It is shifting the burden from the state to a vibrant business community. We need to expand our commercial base here. Again, Somerville is a place to play and a place to live, but not a place to work like it used to be. We need to, again, create special economic zones throughout the city. They need to have tax revenue quotas, commercial tax receipt quotas. And we need to have zoning to support those quotas. It's that simple. Therefore, what I'm looking at is actually a decrease in your taxes over time. It's a long-term strategy, but a strategy that we need to have in place. Now again, there are no results. We, you know, Mystic View Task Force, uh, Patricia Jalen found the organization. It is not produced. We need people who can produce. Thank you. You have 30 seconds if you'd like, Ms. Jalen. I think what people were proposing at Assembly Square was zoning that would promote high-end development and, br and bring in a lot more revenue. That's what Mystic View was proposing, and that's what the city voted down. That's very true, Pat. Uh, but again, okay. six years. What took you six Thank years you. should take six months. I'm going to remind the uh, candidates as well, please don't make me take my jacket off. Uh, do we have any questions for uh, Ms. Jalen? We've had three for Mr. Baird. I feel like, you know, maybe you have one. He's in line. He's over here. I'm going to go with this guy, not because I know him, but because he's closer to the microphone, okay? My name's Joe McCarthy. I'm from Marshall Street. And I'm one of the few worst Republicans in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and that minority in the whole. <laughs> and that my question would be involving the Mr. Task Force. And that where part of the reason one of the things we have a problem with is one, people forget what that area is all about. It's called Assembly Square Mall, and so far we can't get nothing assembled down there. <laughs> uh, during the past three administrations that you've been involved with. In the last administration, the present administration went to the state and got a little loophole to go up on our taxes. One third, what the gentleman was talking about, and that for a two year fix. How are we going to get Assembly Square Mall to do what it's supposed to be doing? Production, sales, 
Could you help me out and explain what you just said? Tax, jump through the tunnel. There's a loophole to go up one third on the property taxes for a two year thing. <coughs> and that's what we're paying on right now. All the, rest, all the property owners in the city of Sunnyvale. The only thing that I think you may be talking about was the ability to shift um, more onto the commercial base and, and off of the residential base. That's the only bill that has passed on the, on the property taxes and that is a temporary bill um, that I can, I'm aware of. My tax increase on my property went up to one. That was not a, as a result of state action, except that we cut local aid and I I'm sorry we did that. If we had voted, if we had voted for the tax cuts that I voted for and not voted for the tax cuts that I voted against, we would have had enough money. And if, uh, if we didn't have the George Bush tax cuts, actually, we wouldn't have, and if that money that was going back in, in tax refunds to the top 1% of people in Massachusetts, if we had that in our coffers, we wouldn't have a budget deficit and we keep all our services. Let me just say one thing about public safety. The top priority for public safety in this city has got to be Oxycontin and heroin. That is the reason kids are dying in our city. And I think we need to cut off the supply and we need to cut off the demand. And I wish I had more time. Maybe somebody will ask me a question about Oxycontin. Um, Mr. Baird, if you'd like, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I think again, you know, I, re, what's the definition of, of leadership? I mean, that's what we have to discuss here because leaders take responsibility for everything that happens on their watch and fails to happen. She continually refuses to take responsibility for failure. She just failed to get a quarter billion dollar capital outlay for a T extension. She will not take responsibility. It is your lack of, I don't know what, you tell me, but you have not performed. Time's up. Do we have another question from Ms. Jalen? Someone who was in line did have his hand raised. Start with the glasses, please step forward. <coughs> Representative Jalen, my name is Zachary Blocker. I live on Glenwood Road. Um, your opponent, Mr. Baird, has quite freely uh, the style of his negative attacks against you indicate that, uh, very vaguely, that the failures to get certain favorable legislation through are your fault, um, and that there is probably some, several things you could have done that you didn't do. Um, specifically, let, let me just pick a specific example, the Lowell Street Bridge. Um, I would love to hear you respond with specifics exactly what is going on with that bridge and how you are there in the fight uh, being a leader. Uh, last year, frustrated at the, at the lack of progress on Lowell Street, um, I called a meeting with the city uh, highway department and the highway department from the state, and they promised us that, well, they told us all the reasons that there had been uh, both financial problems, uh, problems with clearing the rights to the bridge, and construction problems, because it's a complex construction issue. They've also been busy in Somerville, as I said, repairing the Cedar Street Bridge, the um, School Street Bridge, and the Sycamore Street Bridge, and the Walnut Street Bridge. So we had the meeting. They promised construction would start in, in uh, the spring this year and that it would take two construction seasons. Um, I have been calling them every month. Uh, and then we got very frustrated last uh, spring. We started calling them every week. Uh, there were a lot of problems with clearing the rights. Uh, which held us up for a long time. Finally, I decided to hold, hold a public meeting and ask them to explain things in public. And they are starting. They told us two weeks ago that it would be within three weeks. Uh, I am now emailing them because I have a new contact there uh, every week. And I have asked for a mis a, another meeting with Commissioner Cogliano. Mr. Baird, you have 30 seconds. I think that's a problem. It's not about how many meetings you have. It is about results. You can have as many meetings, you know, I hate meetings. I just want to do it. I just want to have action. And the problem is, is that, again, we have, we have not, Charlie Shannon, Vinnie, Vincent Champa, these, you know, state representative, uh, state senator, they're the ones who are picking up for the slack on Pat. You know, Dillboy Field, Dill, Dillboy Field, Ms. Young wasn't even at the invocation ceremony. Time's up. I was at a meeting at the State oh, House. Here comes the jacket. 
<laughs> okay. Thank I, you, folks. Thank you, folks. I do appreciate it. Just trying to be fair with everybody, keeping within the time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back to the line. We're going to take two more questions because we're coming up on the end of this portion of the debate. I appreciate everyone's participation. Mr. Baird, I'm Beverly Schwartz. I live on Highland Road. Um, you suggested that being a state rep is not real work, and I'm wondering what that says about you that you're trying to get that job. <laughs> if, if, that's, if that's what you heard, uh, that was not my intention. Um, I just want to say that Pat Jalen works very hard at that this job and mm -hmm. is often there when I go to the State House and um, I think it's a very hard work and yes. If you don't like to go to meetings, how the heck are you going to be a state? Wow. Sir, <laughs> sir, there's something called personal diplomacy, and for those who know me, know that I can be very diplomatic and and. And I, when I set a goal, I achieve, I achieve it. Nothing stands in between me and that goal. I will get it done, unlike Ms. Jalen. Would you, uh, Ms. Jalen, if you'd like, you have 30 seconds to respond, Ms. Jalen. I wasn't at a, oh, the Del Boy opening because I heard about it the day before. I was at a meeting at the State House of the Elder Caucus, which I chair, and it's not in my district. You were the only one out there. It's not in my district. Anybody? Okay. Can Guy in the back, you don't have a mic. All right. Final question, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Klakota. I live on Bank Street, and uh, my question is for Mr. Baird. Um, up to a year ago, I was a registered Republican and actually hailed from the days when the Republican Party believed in balanced budgets. Uh, we all know that's not the case anymore. And so it leads me to my question. Tonight you propose support for a $259 million Green Line extension, which I think is worthwhile on its own merits, but at the same time you're calling for more tax cuts. Now how can you increase spending and cut taxes without causing dangerously large deficits and which would ultimately uh, bankrupt our state government? That's a good question. Uh, first off, our state government is rife with waste. Okay, so we need to get rid of the waste and reinvest it back into state government to where those tax dollars actually should be going for social services, for capital infrastructure uh, uh, build outs. I mean, it's that simple. So, you know, I don't understand why the incumbent hasn't asked for an audit of every state agency to realize new efficiencies, process reengineering. I don't understand why she's voted just the opposite way. 32 times she's voted to raise your taxes, over a billion dollars in new taxes. This is not what I call good leadership. What we need to do is, again, we need to audit our, our, our state house. I mean, it, there's just nepotism. Uh, you know, Pat voted for, there's a, was ABCC legislation, Alcohol Beverage Commission. Uh, we were going to downsize it in order to uh, pick up the slack during tough fiscal times in 2002. Pat voted to actually reinstate the nine inspector jobs that would have saved you, the taxpayer, a million dollars. Well, a million dollars might sound paltry, but it's the principle. We need to focus on reform at the state house. It's critical. Quick follow on. Is it quick? Um, you mentioned $1 million in savings. How are you going to come up with $259 million? Uh, again, estimated savings for the Pacheco law reform, $273 million. Thank you. Ms. Jalen, you have 30 seconds. We've had 16 years of Republican governors. Saving money is primarily an administrative function. For example, I've done a lot of work on trying to reduce another budget buster, which is the prison system. Uh, the Harshbarger Commission, appointed by Governor Romney, agreed with every single one of my recommendations. That would save money, but we can't do that in the legislature. It's an administrative function. The, the governor asked us to reform the MDC. We did it. What he did is he added mid-level managers. He's asked us to reform the highway Time's system. Up, I'm sorry. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for participating uh, for that session of the debate. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're beautiful people. You look great on camera. And once again, according to the 50,000-page memorandum of understanding, 
Uh, Mr. Baird will have three minutes of closing remarks, followed by Ms. Jalen with her three minutes. Uh, feel free to begin when you're ready, Mr. Jalen. Mr. Baird. Okay, well, thanks again for coming. I do appreciate your time. Some real needs a new vision. Uh, again, some real needs to be a place not only to play and live, but also a place to work. I do have a plan to get us there, to reduce your taxes over time, as well as to do capital infrastructure improvements that are going to take the city to the next level. Ms. Jalen's had 14 years to achieve tasks that have not been achieved. Lowell Street Bridge, the, the Dillboy Field, uh, the Somerville Hockey Rink, Assembly Square Mall. These are all critical to our city. She can talk and have meetings and talk and have meetings, but when does it stop? Well, the buck stops with her, and she has not performed. I will perform as your state representative. I will take the lead. If I do not perform, then I expect to be thrown out after, my next, after a two-year period. But that won't happen because I am a hard worker. And not only that, I have a proven track record of results. And I do appreciate your time. And go Red Sox. And now for Ms. Jalen's closing remarks. Again, you have three minutes. I'm not usually a very partisan person, but I feel like this year um, I am. Uh, the Republicans used to be the particle of fiscal sanity, but now their solution to every single problem is more tax cuts for the rich. One recent example is that the uh, unemployment trust fund is running out of money. Governor Romney's solution is to cut benefits and uh, cut payments so that the unemployment fund would be in worse trouble except for you, if you become an employee, would have a hard time qualifying. My Republican opponent will tell you that you can have all the services you're used to and pay less taxes. People in Somerville have never been fooled by that before, and I doubt they will this time. We voted against cutting the income tax, we voted against eliminating the income tax, and we voted against Governor Romney. Governor Romney told us we could cut taxes and still preserve services. One of his first acts in office it was to cut Somerville's local aid by $3 million. His first budget eliminated Prescription Advantage, which thousands of seniors used to be able to afford their medicine. This year, he vetoed 2% raises for people working on state contracts who make less than $25,000. My opponent and Governor Romney want to pretend that reform would save enough money to fund everything. Uh, we've done the reform of the MDC that he wanted, but he's just added more managers. Uh, we merged the functions of the Highway Department and the Turnpike Authority in Massport, but we refused to hand over the Turnpike's reserves and to put the burden of paying off the Turnpike's bonds on the taxpayer. The Mass Taxpayers Foundation, a respected business group, uh, said that it would cost the state hundreds of million dollars and prevent the bonding of projects like the Lowell Street Bridge and the Green Line. Another concern I have about Republican campaigns this year is their lack of respect for facts and civility. Mr. Barrett has made numerous claims about my voting records, which are simply not true. Yes, they are. The Republican part, well, I told you that they gave him lot. <laughs> With thousands of roll calls paid for by the Republican Party, he is still wrong about many of them. Now, I, I would say that some of them tonight he has been correct, but on his website and in his letters, he's gotten several of them wrong. And like Dick Cheney, he's saying that people are less safe with a Democrat in office. I think we can use, discuss issues using facts and not scare tax or insults. I want to urge everybody in the audience, and I think a lot of you are, to become players in state government. You can help me make the decisions. I invite you to my workshop on November 16th, where I always teach people how to write their own legislation. I have an annual bu budget workshop where I teach you to cut your own budget. And at least once a month, I send out an email newsletter about state and local developments. Democracy is not a spectator sport. I hope you'll vote for me on November 2nd, and I hope you'll get involved and help me make good decisions after that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes.